Okay, so my finger. I want to thank. I want to thank them for reaching out to me and inviting me here this evening to share my experiences with you. Just as an aside, as a as a footnote, I was not actually the first one there, but I was a first responder. Um, I was a first responder on September 11th. Over the past 25 years, I've had the privilege of being a member of Hatzalah first in Farakaway and for the past 15 years in Flatbush. My rabbi, Rabbi Rokach Shlita, he tells us that Hashem talks to us, but we always we have to listen. We have to want to hear what the Rabboni Shalom is telling us. Three days or four days before September 11th, 2001, Chav Kimel Elul, we lay in Parshas Kisavo, and in the Parsha it, it tells us uh, we had, there were three pesukim that came, that came to fruition word for word. A brazen nation that will not be respectful to the, to the young nor gracious to the old. A language, who's, a language who you will not understand will devour the fruit of your animals and the fruit of the ground until, until you are destroyed. It will not leave you any grain or wine or offspring for your cattle or flocks and your goats until it causes you to perish. It will besiege you in all your cities until the collapse of your high fortified walls. In which, in which you trusted throughout the land and all your cities in which Hashem your God has given you. So you're going to tell me, but surely there were no cattle and no flocks walking around Manhattan. In the World Trade Center, there was something called the Mercantile Exchange that deals with commodities of agriculture. These three or four pesukim came to fruition literally word for word. So now if you follow along with me, let me take you back 18 years to Lower Manhattan, September 11, 2001. September 11, 2001 started as probably one of the most routine textbook mornings possible. It was a crystal clear sky, it was a week before the Yom Hadin, it was a week before Rosh Hashanah, and I had gone to Slichos the night before because I had started a new job, I was working in Lower Manhattan. I had gone to Slichos the night before, and I was, already, I was already in the city by about 7.30, 7.45, sitting at my desk. As a member of Hatzalah, my radio comes with me all the time. There's no time that, it's ever without, that a Hatzalah member is ever without their radio. Even if you're not going, even if you're not going to go anywhere, you always listen to the chatter. And that morning was no different, being that I was at a new job, I had very little work to do, but I wanted to show them, obviously, that I was, that I was anxious and I was ready, and I was ready to hit the ground running, so I was there at my desk at about 7.30, 7.45, and the radio was, was, was chattering away that morning. A pedestrian struck here, a patient passed out there, and so on and so forth. Again, it was the most typical routine textbook morning. It was a beautiful, beautiful morning. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, it was crystal clear. The sky was a baby blue, it was about 60 degrees. And again, the radio was just talking away as it normally does, nothing out of the ordinary. And then at about, <clears throat> I guess approximately 8.45, 8.46 to be exact, Aaron Rothman, who was, an, who was another member of Hatzalah here in Flappish, he had just come out of the tunnel, and he, saw the, he didn't see the first plane because it came from the other direction, but he saw the impact on the other side he saw the impact on the other side coming out of the tunnel. He saw the, he saw the backflash of the explosion and the debris and the, and the shattered glass. And he called into our dispatcher for, on a priority call, a code one, that, there was been a, that there's been an explosion at the World Trade Center. Instantly, the, all three ambulances from the Lower East Side, there was an ambulance downtown Manhattan, as well as the other ambulances from the Lower East Side began descending on the World Trade Center as did EMS, as did the fire department, and as did Hatzalah literally throughout the city. They came from the Upper West Side, from the Upper East Side, from Washington Heights, from Borough Park, from Flatbush. We were all there with literally, literally within minutes. As Soon as I heard that, I grabbed my radio from my desk and I ran by my, my new boss's office. Her name was Nancy Casey. And they said they had, they had known that I was a member of uh, Hatzalah, that I knew, they knew that I was a volunteer because it had been on my resume that I was a volunteer EMT. So I told her that there had been some type of explosion at the World Trade Center and that our dispatcher was sending us and I was going to head down there the few blocks away. She told me to be safe and wished me the best. Ran down the 10 flights of steps and ran the two or three blocks to the World Trade Center and as I rounded the corner, the only way I could describe what I saw, it was an awesome sight, obviously not in a good way. There was a hole, probably about 10 floors, and there was black smoke billowing. All you heard in the background were sirens coming from all directions. It was literally, it was chaos. There were helicopters. And when you looked up, it was, it was like a ticker tape parade almost. It was raining paper. And when you looked up above what, what's called the hit zone, you saw, and you could see it on videos, you could see it close up, you saw literally hundreds of people hanging out those windows knowing that there was no way out. I, I eventually hooked up with some of the other members from Manhattan and we began treating some of the, some of the patients that had, that had been hit with falling debris. Because at the end of the day there were really no, there weren't that many injuries on September 11th. You either survived or you didn't. 
We began treating. There was people that had been hit by glass and by falling debris. And again, the scene was chaos. Now understand, when one becomes a fireman or an EMT, a policeman, the first thing they tell you, they teach you something called scene safety. If you don't feel that the scene is safe, for whatever the reason, you're not obligated to go in and put yourself in danger. That morning, we took scene safety and we put it to the side because there couldn't have been a more unsafe scene than two buildings that had, that had jumbo jets resting, resting on their inner facade. So again, we began, there were, there were plenty of patients on the ground to treat, and <clears throat> as we began, I, we were treating, we were there for about 10, 15 minutes, I heard a very loud sound. And up until that point, for the most part, we had thought it was some type of accident, obviously, how such a thing could happen on a crystal clear day, but things happen. We heard a sound, and we looked up, and there it was, the second plane, and it was literally heading straight for the tower. And I remember saying to the person who I was with, I was with a man by the name of Eddie Lowenthal, a member of Westside Hatzalah, I don't understand. What's he doing? And we watched, we watched as that plane literally flew directly into tower, to tower really it was tower one, because tower two was hit first. And when that plane hit, the ground shook like an earthquake, the building rocked back and forth. And when you see in the pictures, you see that explosion, you see that fireball. The only way that I could explain it to you is if you've ever gotten too close to a grill and you instinctively jump back, we felt that blast of heat on the ground. At that point, I began to become a little bit nervous because we understood that this obviously was not an accident. This was some type of coordinated attack. But at that point, when I said to somebody, you know, I really want, I want to get out of here, they said, there's really no place to go, so you might as well just stay. And that's what we did. And the first time we went, we took our first patient on the West Side Hatzalah Ambulance. We went to St. Vincent's. And when we, we opened up the back of the ambulance, excuse me, when we opened up the back of the ambulance and we took our patient out, the sight that I saw was, again, was an awesome sight, not in a good way. Something that you literally all, have only seen on the movies. There were about 50 or 60 hospital beds lined up on the street. By each bed, there was, a, there was a doctor and a nurse and paramedics with equipment and crash carts. Each bed had an IV pole with an IV and, and, and wires all ready to go. But there were just no patients. Because again, the people that were in the towers, if you were on top of the hit zone, you were not coming home that night. So we brought that first patient. We went back to, we went back to ground zero. And no matter how many times you went back, the fire trucks kept coming, and ambulances kept coming, and police kept coming literally from all, from all over the city. People kept coming out. People were pouring out of the towers. They were running out. They were panicking. They were screaming. They were crying. Some, some of them were covered with water because the sprinkler, the sprinkler system had been activated in the lobby of the towers. There were quite a few Hatzala members in the lobby of the towers, even moments up until moments before the towers came down. Father Judge. The, the chaplain for the fire department, he was there. He was, he was the, the priest for the fire department. He was in full turnout gear. We had, we had interacted with him. We passed him about 10, 10 or 15 minutes before he was killed. He was killed by the second problem, the second challenge that we faced, and that was jumpers. The problem was we felt the heat on the ground from that explosion. So if we could feel the heat on the ground, we could only imagine what it was like 80, 90, 100 floors up that people made a decision that morning that they would either die by incineration or by flight. And people were jumping. Not one or two, not three or four. 15, 20, 30, 40, 100 people. They were coming out of the towers one after the other, holding hands together. And Father Judge, he was killed by a jumper. That made the scene even more unsafe. Because now you had two buildings with airplanes resting in them. You had people jumping. It was just an extremely unsafe scene it was a chaotic scene because no matter how much training you have, whether you're a volunteer, a fireman, a, a paramedic, an EMT, a fireman, a policeman, nothing could actually prepare you for a mass casualty incident of this magnitude. We had made a, one or two other runs between the hospital and we came around. We came around. I don't exactly remember the name of the street. It was either Day Street or Vay Street. It was within, within half a block or a block of the tower. We had put one patient onto the ambulance. It was me, it was myself, another EMT, another EMT from Staten Island, and Eddie Lowenthal from the west side. We had another gentleman who was sitting on the crew bench. He was also a patient. <clears throat> he had been hit with debris, he was cut. And I remember him saying to me so vividly, <clears throat> you know, what, what do you think's gonna be? And he said, I don't know. I was much younger than it was 18 years ago. I was all of 25 years old. You didn't think about mortality. All of a sudden, 
out of the blue, the ground started to shake. It was even louder than the first time. There was the, the, noise, the noise was louder than any airplane. It got louder and louder, and the ground shook harder and harder. And all of a sudden, we heard a loud thud, and it was dark. Then the radio again, the chatter over the radio. At, at one point during this whole thing, 911's radio system had gone down. The phone lines had gone down. The cell phone system had gone down. Cell phones weren't then what it is like today. Not everybody had a cell phone. People were scrambling. There were no cells available. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, one of the, the antennas were on top of the tower. So when, when the tower came down, it took the cell service with it. And I remember when the tower came down, I began to panic. And I remember this man who was not Jewish. I remember him. I could see his face till today. He said to me, please, I'm not Jewish, but please pray for me. I panicked. I was extremely scared because at that point, it was the first time in my life that I thought I was going to die. And I remember Eddie Lowenthal telling me, this is not the time for this. You have a job to do. We're going to go home tonight one way or the other. He said, you're either going to go home to your house or you're going to go home. Now treat your patients. And with that, I began to refocus. And when you, face, when you face death face to face, there comes a point where you make peace with it. And at that point, I, I kind of felt that, okay, it is what it is. I have a job to do now. And it's not as scary as people make it out to be. At that time, I only had one daughter. She happens to be here tonight. She was all of one years old. And of course, that went through, that went through my mind as well. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, there was no way out. We were here. These were the cards we were dealt. And that's what we were going to do. And I remember, I remember if you listen on, if you go onto YouTube, you could actually hear, thank you. You can actually hear the Hatzala recordings of the panic and pandemonium. And at one point, if you listen, if you go onto YouTube, you'll hear it. It's from Yeshiva World. About seven minutes into that recording, you'll hear me calling into the dispatcher on a priority. And you could hear the panic in my voice. Um, there were many other members. There were members that were trapped. There were about 40 members at that time that were trapped in the Gateway parking garage. There were members that were trapped at 1 John Street. There were members that were trapped all over. And the dispatcher, as, as calm as he was, he had an achrayis and he felt, I, I, I had spoken to him afterwards, he felt an achrayis. He sent us there. And, you know, he's only hearing, he's hearing the back, the, the back end. He's hearing, he was sitting in his house in Williamsburg dispatching, and we were all there on the front lines, if you will. Um, there, were there were members that were literally buried alive. Um, and at some point, I remember Eddie Lowenthal, he called into the dispatcher and as panicked as I was, he was cool, calm, and collective. He gave the dispatcher our location. And he also told the dispatcher, because the dispatcher was having a very, very difficult time communicating with the members because so many members were calling in at once. And it was staticky and it was choppy and people were screaming. There was a member from Crown Heights who called in and he said, at least t please tell my wife that I said Shema. It was pure panic and pan pandemonium. And at the end of the day, many of us thought that we were not going home that night. Eddie Lowenthal called in and he gave the dispatcher our location. He was a little bit, we weren't 100% sure of our location. <clears throat> Again, we, we, we had parked. At, at, at one point, we were, we were next to the fire department command post. We were moved away from there, which ultimately, which ultimately saved many of us because those, those people that were in that command post were killed, including uh, Captain Fahey and Captain Downing from the New York City Fire Department. And at some point, um, that we, were, we were located. We ended up, we got out, we switched ambulances, we took, the, the patients came off with us. And when we, when we walked out and looked, it was literally, it was, it was something from a movie. And all I know is I wanted to leave, I wanted to be out of there, and I couldn't get out of there quick enough. It had looked like it had snowed. Everything was covered in white. We were covered in white. But everything was covered in white outside. Glass storefronts were sm smashed, cars were smashed. It literally looked like a tornado had come through and left nothing in its path. We ended up on a different ambulance. We got onto the F, and I remember so vividly like, like it happened yesterday. We were driving on the FDR drive, and I remember, saying to, I remember saying to him, this Staten Island member was driving, and I was in the back with Eddie Lowenthal. If you remember the last scene of Schindler's List, and they, they show you all the hundreds of people that he saved and coming towards you. That's what the FDR drive looked like. There were hundreds, thousands of people just walking on the FDR, FDR drive, dazed. Dazed and confused, and they kept, everybody kept looking back. I was, not there for the, I was not there at the time that the second tower collapsed. Um, we had been taken to NYU, where we were hosed down, decontaminated. We were literally covered from head to toe in dust. Um, and when all was said and done, I had to find a way, I had to find a way home. Nothing, nothing was working, none of the ambulances were heading back. So I decided I just wanted, I wanted to leave, I was done, I had done my part. 
So I began walking over the Williamsburg Bridge, and I remember halfway across, we saw something that we had never seen in New York before. Two F-14s or F-35 fighter jets flew above, literally where you could touch them. And I remember instinctively, everybody panicked because they didn't know what it was. They didn't realize that it was the armed forces coming to patrol the skies of New York City. And I remember everybody on the bridge ducked instinctively. They were scared because it, it was a new world. And we had gotten up and I remember there was a Hatzalah car that was on the other side. I remember seeing him and I got on my radio and I, I told him to please stop. I ended up getting a ride back to Williamsburg where I went to the command center, the dispatch center where they were dispatching from in Williamsburg. It took me another few hours to get home. And I remember when I got home, the first thing I saw, it was the strangest thing. There were papers on my front porch, and at the time I lived in Marine Park on East 34th Street. There were papers on my porch from the World Trade Center. It was, and they were charred and they were burnt, and it was a very eerie thing. And I remember when I was in NYU, I remember there was somebody who was there, and he was, he was a middle-aged guy, and he was from Israel, and he had told me that he had been in the army, he had been in the Israeli army, so he asked me, you know, what happened, to, you know, what I had seen. And he said to me, he says, you know, you're going to have flashbacks. And I said to him, what are you talking about? I'm not going to have flashbacks. He said, trust me. And I, it was all fine and good, and I remember, I remember going to shul that night. Everybody was talking. At, at the time, they were still looking for Shimi Beagle Eyes and Hashem Yim Kam Damam. And it was all fun. And I remember when I got home after Marav, and it had gotten dark, that's, that's when I wasn't so tough anymore. So we decided that night we weren't going to stay home. I was scared. I guess my wife was scared, too. So we went to my wife's grandparents in Borough Park. <clears throat> both Holocaust survivors, and I remember when we got there, my wife's grandmother said she couldn't go outside because she said the smell outside was the smell of burning flesh. She said it smelled no different from Auschwitz and the camps that she was in. This is what happened right here. <clears throat> Two or three days later, Heshi Jacobs, Allah HaShalom, he was the president of Hatzalah at the time. He was walking through the ruins of Ground Zero with the Honorable Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, and they were talking and they were looking at the, the devastation of Lower Manhattan, and Mayor Giuliani said to him, so, you know, how many people did you lose? And he turns to Mayor Giuliani, he said, we didn't lose anybody. And Mayor Giuliani said, it's not possible. He said, I saw all of you there. I saw them with the green vests and the side locks. And I saw all of the ambulances and the cars. I saw the hundreds of volunteers that were there. It can't be, it can't be that you didn't lose anybody. He said, no, each and every one of us went home that night. Mayor Giuliani turned to Heshi Jacobs, Allah HaShalom, and said, you are indeed, you are truly God's people. And indeed we are. People said that September 11th happened because of Western values and American democracy. September 11th happened because of America's special relationship with Eretz Yisrael and Israel. People, our blood has always been sheep. It's always been sheep in the eyes of the world. America has always been good to Eretz Yisrael and the Jewish people, and for that they were going to be punished. The great pun of Itzarov, Rav Yosef Shlomo Kahaneman, on one of his many fundraising trips, he ended up in, of all places, he ended up in Rome. And he got there in the middle of the night, he was picked up by a man by the name of Mr. Rothschild, and he tells Mr. Rothschild, come, we must go to this and this place. And Mr. Rothschild said, but, but Rabbi, it's the middle of the night and it's freezing, but Rav Kahaneman was undeterred. He said, but it's raining. And again, Rav Kahaneman was undeterred, and they went to a place that Ada Yom Hazeh bears the name of Titus, Shar Titus, after Titus destroyed Yushalayim, his brother made him this memorial in Rome that has, that has the pictures of him pillaging and plowing Yushalayim. The Pun of Itzarov got out. He got out of this carriage that he was picked up in. He straightened his coat and he straightened his hat and he looked up at that, at that gate and he says, Titus, where have you gone? You came to Yushalayim so many years ago. You came to pillage, to plow and to destroy. And where are you today? You're nothing but a name on a wall. But look at me. And this was 50 or 60 years ago. He goes, I have a yeshiva. I have a yeshiva in Bnei Brak in Israel with a kol Torah is Yom Velayla. You today are nowhere. Each and every one of us should take solace that like Yosef HaTzadik was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's was, I'm sorry, that Yosef HaTzadik was Yaakov's special child and he wore the Kisonas Pasim, that technicolor coat. We should each take solace that each and every one of us, we are Hashem's special children. We wear that special coat that He has given us and with that, that should serve as a Shmira and we should be Zoychet HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ultimate protection and ultimate Matana Mashiach Zedkenu B'mhera B'yameinu Amen V'Amen. I thank you for inviting me and I thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Shirley Korn, for sharing your personal experience with us.
I'd like to invite all of you to participate. Bezir uh, Hashem, we have a tremendous simcha we're going to have Sunday morning. We're making a bris for a 25-year-old student of ours. And if you'd like to participate in his spiritual growth in helping us build Jewish generations, any uh, amount, any donation will be very appreciated and a special schuss for the new year. Also, I'd like to mention, everyone is welcome to join us for the Yom Naram for the High Holidays. We actually open the door to many unaffiliated Jews, couples, students, young professionals, and this is their first experience connecting with the Almighty. So we don't charge them for seats. So we ask people that are part of the community if you could help us and give a few dollars, $200 would help us cover so we can maintain this beautiful shul all year and also keep it a very welcoming environment for people that would have uh, no other place, perhaps, where they feel welcomed and then they feel proud to connect with the heritage. Uh, Baruch Hashem here in BJX. So without further ado, I'd like to now introduce uh, our Rav of Brooklyn Jewish Experience, the dynamic force behind all the Kirov activities at our two centers uh, around Brooklyn and uh, throughout the world with his uh, few books that he's written, his articles, his speeches, his lectures. He's very, very well known and uh, very happy to be under his umbrage and his leadership. So without further ado, Rabbi Yitzchak Fingerer. Thank you to Rabbi Moshe for everything he does. He's the real force behind the force. All right, come sit down. Everybody, there are, there are some seats left, please. The overflow, please come inside. There are seats here. You don't have to stand in the back. There are some seats here, please. Make yourselves comfortable. I'd like to ask everybody to take a moment to silence. For all those that perished on September 11th and 9-11. Hashem yinkom damam. May Hashem avenge their blood. 9-11 is a uniquely American day. The most catastrophic, devastating, atrocious day in American history. The worst and largest attack on American soil Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, 2,300 people were killed in December 1941. On 9-11-2001, almost 3,000 people were killed. However, 9-11 is also a uniquely Jewish day. And the reason why 9-11 is a uniquely Jewish day is because if you read Bin Laden's fatwa, his religious doctrine, his diatribe, what he calls the war against the West and Israel, Eretz Israel, he cites Israel numerous times. And one of the reasons why he waged war, and 9 11, don't get it wrong, was a declaration of war, was because of America's support for the Jewish people, for Eretz Israel, for Israel. And therefore, as Jews, is it exceedingly appropriate that we gather today on 9-11 to commemorate the Talmud says in Tracta Yavamas, page 63, a Baralam, Yisrael. The reason why punishment, suffering, devastation, ruination descends upon the world is in the account of the Jew. Everything revolves around the Jewish people. How do you explain that? The Medrash says, Barajas Baralukim. In the beginning, God created, says the Medrash. That who is called Rashis, the head, the beginning? Yisrael, the Jew. The entire universe was created 
for the Jew to take ownership over the world, to elevate this world, to inspire the world, to instill and infuse and inject and empower the world and our fellow human beings with holiness, with purpose, so we feel driven and we accomplish. That's why we're here. And that's why every flaw, every imperfection that occurs in the world is attributed to us, to you, to me. Bishvil Yisrael. Wow, what an awesome responsibility. Most of us, many of us, cannot remember Pearl Harbor. And we can't remember another fateful day in American history, a seismic day, Kennedy's assassination. But almost all of us can remember 9-11. We were witness to it. The most cataclysmic event of our history, of our times. I want to share with you what the Rambam Maimonides says. Maimonides says that if a person dear attribute history to randomness or arbitrary machinations, that person is guilty because everything occurs, history is because of the divine, because of God. And therefore history is a labyrinth. It's a maze for us to decode, decipher, unravel, unveil the hidden message from the Bosho, from the master of the universe, from the Bashefa, from the creator of the universe. What is it trying to communicate to me? What's it all about? Why 9-11? Why that date? In the secular calendar, 365 days, why was 9-11 chosen? Isn't it eerie that if you study history and unravel and decode and decipher the Torah, we get to a very interesting phenomenon. You see, in the year 2047, Avraham Avinu, our patriarch Avraham, he made a request that we all regret today, but he had his cheshbonus, he had his calculations. And he asked the Rebosh, and he asked God Almighty, he said, Lu Yishmael, our arch nemesis, the most antagonistic person at that time, Yishmael. And he says, Lu Yishmael, Yichyel Efenecha, let Yishmael live. Bless Yishmael. He's also my child. And I tell you, God was too generous and kind. Because not only does God say, I'll bless him, but we know that Torah and God is renowned for its brevity, for being very concise and terse. There's nothing superfluous or extraneous or redundant in the Torah. And of course, from God. God's not mortal. God's infinite. And what does God say back to Abraham, to Avram? Sure. Harbe, Arbe! Not only will I make him many, I'm going to make him bountiful. Are you very? Zaidi Avraham, why did you have to ask for a blessing for your smile? Rebarsha, why did you give such a generous and kind? Why were you so beneficent? Why were you so magnanimous? Could have just said, okay, I'll let him eat some sushi on Thursday nights, you know? I mean, that would have been enough. Okay, maybe some pizza will throw in too, an Italian dish. Harba, harba! I'm going to make him great. More than great. That was in the year 2047. It took years for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And many people were probably scratching their heads and saying, well, gee, if the Torah is divine, if God really said that, why isn't it not unfolding? What in the world is going on here? And people may have started doubting and being dubious. Well, fast forward to the year 4,383. 2,336 years later, which gives me comfort, by the way. I'll tell you why. Because this was a secular year of 622 AD, of the Common Era. What happened that year? The advent of Mohammed in Mahshima, where the Islam becomes the dominant force in the world to repress and to try to annihilate, to 
try to force convert. But 2,336 years, the Arabs waited. So why is it comforting to me? Because we got a promise as well. Almost the same year that Yishmael got his promise. Well, we got to wait a little longer than 2,336 years. But it means that our promise is coming. The fulfillment is coming. 622, the Arabs take the world by storm. And you know what happens? It's the year 1683 when the Arabs decide that their mission this is all theological. This is all religious. They got to take over the world. The Middle East, Mesopotamia is not enough. They got to get Flappish and Crown Heights and Borough Park. They got to get everything. And therefore, they attempt to go to Europe and make war and take over Vienna. The King of Poland! Stops them in their tracks. And the Arabs are defeated. Baruch Hashem. The Ottomans are defeated. Otherwise, we'd all be wearing hijabs. And walking around the pajamas all day. But when was that? In 1683. What was the date? The date was September 11th. And that's why. Bin Laden chooses 9-11. Because 9-11... It's his declaration of war against the West. And he says, I wasn't successful in 1683, but I will be successful in 2001. And this is my reprisal. This is my vendetta. This is my revenge. This is my declaration and pronouncement. I am taking over the world. I, Islam, we are taking over the world. Amen. <laughs> 9-11. However, the Perky the Rebel Yezer, the Medrash, the Zah Kadosh, and many Mikaros, many sources say that Islam will go into hibernation. They will be dormant. <coughs> That's what happened for hundreds of years. But there will be a resurgence, there will be a revival. They will go from potential to kinetic energy. <coughs> and it will happen. And people looked at this Nevoah, they looked at this prophecy, and they said, Arabs have no force. Hundreds of years ineffective until 9 11. They're back. The Nevoah comes true. That ultimately, who will try to wage attack against the Jewish people in Eretz Israel to usher in Mashiach and be the harbinger for Mashiach? The Arabs. They'll be back. So 9-11 was a colossal day for Jewish and world and American history. But it goes further. Perhaps the date 9-11 is significant for another reason. Because 9 11 is 9 1 1. We always thought that if we have an emergency, we have whom to reach out to. 9 11 changed all that. Why did it change all? 9 11 was a day that showed the susceptibility, the vulnerability that we have no one to rely upon. There's no one to call. Try to call the Pentagon. The Pentagon was attacked. Try to call the FBI, the CIA. Try to call the NYPD. This is before de Blasio. There was, there was no one to call. The terrorists, and this is something that we have to meditate on. There's something you gotta ponder and reflect and introspect on, because if you don't, then you're sinning like the Rambam says. Then you're viewing events as just arbitrary and random, as mikre, chas v'shalom, God forbid. The terrorists that perpetrated the largest 
attack ever on American soil in American history that changed the world forever, that destroyed lives, that has collateral damage, that is still destroying lives because there were people that were affected and lives that were utterly transformed. I mean, who would imagine? I mean, I used to travel all the time. I never had to take off my shoes. I remember the first time after 9-11, they asked me to take off my shoes. I said, you sure? You sure? I said, maybe everybody should come with gas masks now. What's going on here? We used to go on airplanes. And they had this little gadget, you know, that you walk. It wasn't invasive. It wasn't intrusive. They had their body scanners. They frisk you. How did it all start? Because you had these terrorists that had major, major weapons. No. Remember, these terrorists pulled off the greatest attack in our history without any armaments, artillery, weapons, nothing. They used box cutters. What a bad boy would bring to school and get suspended for. How did they slip through the radar of all the intelligence bureau and agencies? You know that somebody told me? I haven't been able to corroborate, authenticate, verify it 100%, but it seems that the Arabs got in. They were able to get into our country and they attended flight schools in Florida. Training to be pilots. And one of the flight instructors was very, very confounded and bewildered that his student said, oh, you don't have to teach me how to land or descend the plane. That's okay. Why would a student not want to learn how to descend? And when he saw a guy that was Middle Eastern, he got a little worried. He supposedly called into the authorities. No one cared. Of course he did not know how to have to know how to land. He was going on a suicide mission. Attack. No weapons able to penetrate. What is this telling us? What a signal, what a message. Uru Yashayna Mishinasa, wake up from your lethargy, from your slumber. Arouse from your apathy and indifference. Don't be a fool. Don't think that if you're armed, you could do something. I will never forget on 9 11. I called 911. I picked up a phone. I didn't know if I had a cell phone back then. A landline. And I dialed 911. It was dead. I was panicking. I said, 911 always works. What, are they out to lunch? 911 didn't work on that day, if you remember. It was dead. You know what the Talmud and Saito says? It says it twice. And I'll paraphrase from it. It speaks about the ikvist of the Mashiach, the footsteps of Mashiach, the Messianic age. And it gives different signs. And the summation, the encapsulation, the culmination of it all is Ein Lanu Ami Li Shain. There is nothing and no one for us to rely upon. There will come a time, the time of Mashiach, when we will have no one and nothing to rely upon. Ella, Avinu Sheba Shemayim. Only our God in heaven. There's no one else. No Pentagon, no CIA, no FBI. No military intelligence. Nothing. Only Hashem. Never forget that. Because history is bound to repeat itself. As one great philosopher once said, the greatest lesson to learn from history is not to learn from history. We're the Jews. We're the engines. We are the catalysts. We gotta get our act together. 
Im lachshav emosai. If not now, when? We're in El now. We're preparing for Yom Hadin, for the Yom Hadin, for the days of awe, for the high holy days, for the days of judgment and justice. How appropriate is the mission of us, which also appears in the Talmud, Gemara Shabbos, Kofun and Gimel, Shuv Yoimechel of Nemi Sescha, which means live every day like it's your last. You'll say, why would I want to live such a morbid life? I wake up in the morning and say, today's my last day. Let me ask for my last, request my last supper. There are gluttons out there and Epicureans out there who if they think it's the last day, they'll say, oh, let me gorge on sushi or something, you know? That's why we always serve sushi here. You see, I love talking about sushi. But that, that's what their lives are about. Live every day like it's your last. It's not morbid. It's the most empowering thought out there. Because it means that every single day, if you live it like it's your last, you know what it means? It means you will be bakavadik. You will be respectful. You will be kind. You will live your life according to Torah every single day because you want to die pure. And you understand there's a reckoning, there's a judgment. On the day of 9-11, no one anticipated that it would be the last day. There was no warning. Generally in a war, there's some kind of indication. There's some kind of subtle nuance that you could pick up if you're aware. On 9-11, we were caught in total surprise. Shuv yoimecha lefnei miseska, live every day like it's your last. I want to tell you a story about a couple, a married couple. They had a routine where they got up in the morning and they usually have a coffee together before he would leave to work, she would leave much later to work. And one morning, they got up, they had their coffee, and then something happened. We don't have to go into the gory details because I don't know the details. It's not a story from our community. It's a story that has been out there in the media. But that morning, this otherwise happy couple got into an argument. And it escalated as most arguments do. And that's why we have a Torah that tells us how to monitor our traits and attributes. And what we're allowed to say, what we're not allowed to say. Most people think that the Torah is only for questions about what you're allowed to eat, whether you've got to keep the Sabbath, Shabbos. No. The Torah is much more than that. The Torah is about our daily living. It's about what we're allowed to think. It's our thoughts, our actions, interrelations, interactions, accountability. And that morning, just as he was leaving to work, as it got much, much worse, the argument, she saw him out the door, but she didn't give him lunch. She told him, I hope you drop dead. Not Lashonus. That's Nivelpe, that's vulgar. But when people in the heat of an argument, they say things that they shouldn't. And that's why the Gemara tells us, the Talmud says, that when somebody gets angry, call me Gehenim Shulten boy. It's Gehenim. And the Zohar says, that when you get angry, you're no longer worshiping God. You're worshipping yourself or you're worshipping idols. Because you become possessed and obsessed with something other than God. Because if you believe in God, you don't get angry. Because you believe God's in charge. Well, he went on the FDR. He went to work and that morning happened to have been 9-11. And he did drop dead. He was one of those that fell out the window. Or jumped out of the window. Very scary. If you live every day like it's your last. That wouldn't happen. Because today may be the day. And therefore I'm going to be very, very careful with what I say. With the way I behave. How I act. But there's another story. This story is a true story. I verified it again today, even though I heard it a few years ago. But I always try to make sure that whatever I say is researched. You know what the story is? His name was Mati. And he was going to the World Trade Center for a very important meeting. 
a very urgent meeting that had to do with his sustenance, with his parnasa. His wife called him and she said, where are you? He said, you know, I have a very important meeting that was scheduled. She said, did you forget? We have a date together today. We've been planning. For some reason, men forget anniversaries and birthdays. That's why a man in Hebrew is called Zachar, to remind him that he's supposed to remember. <laughs> Zachar means remember. <laughs> and the keva is nekev from the word hole because the woman is always supposed to fill the holes in the man. To remind him of things. And she said, how could you? How dare you? We have a date together. He said, you know, a rain check. And she said, that's not appropriate. You know, you gave me your word. And he said, you know, he was thinking about it. He was contemplating it. And he said, you know, Shalom Bayez, the Torah tells us that for peace, you're allowed to erase Hashem's name. We even know, and don't do this without a rabbinic or without asking a Shiloh. But you're allowed to lie for the sake of peace, a white lie sometimes, a fair Shagamar, explicit Gamar, and Shagamar. And he said, I have a tremendous dilemma. I'm in a quagmire. This is a real conundrum. What do I do? Shalom bias or Parnassa? Yeah. Then he was thinking, well, if I come home with a nice paycheck, maybe that will make her feel better. For some reason, it doesn't. Women like the attention. And he decided, he made his mind up, that he would turn around and go back home. And he went back home. But he canceled the meeting. They weren't so happy about it. The next day was September 12th. Because you see, that day was 9-11-2001. And he was supposed to be in the World Trade Center. Had he been there and not listened to his other half, his better half, he would have been a victim. He called up this woman that he canceled with the day before. I said, I want to apologize. He says, you're saying you're sorry? Do you realize that because you canceled, I called up the other three people that were supposed to be at the meeting, and I canceled them. You saved four lives. For Sean Bias, goes a long way. I want to share something with you. 9-11 has a history that most people don't know. You see, 1993 was the first attempt on the World Trade Center. Who perpetrated that? It was none other than El Sa'id Nosser Yemachshemo. And then he also had a plan, a very extensive plan, to bomb the tunnels, the Lincoln Tunnel, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps also the Holland Tunnel, and the major bridges that's where every time I go on a bridge or a tunnel, I say a special tefillah. Tefillah Sadarach. Because I realize that had the Arabs had their way, those bridges and tunnels would not be here today. In 1993, El Nasser, who ended up becoming the assassin of none other than Rabbi Meir Kahana, Allah Shalom. El Sa'in Nasser was exonerated and acquitted. There were eyewitnesses. No one doubted it. But this is our justice system. Call it liberalism, whatever you want to call it. He was acquitted. But they went into El San Nosser, the mastermind, who had the foresight to destroy the World Trade Center, and they went into his apartment. They did a search, an authorized search. And you'll never believe what it said. Listen to what it said. They found his plans. And in his plans, he said, we call for a jihad. I've been practicing how to pronounce jihad. Against the enemies of Islam. How? Listen very carefully. By destroying the structure of their civilized pillars, their high world buildings, which they are proud of. Do you understand what this means? The posture that was read three days before 9-11, what does it say? It 
Yitzin Sefer Devarim Perakov Ches Parshas Ki Savoy. Pesach Numbeis, verse fifty-two. There will be an enemy that will come, a brazen nation, whom you don't recognize. The hates our Rachel, the whole Shorecha, had read the Shoy Mosecha, had the very Shabbat Surah Shashata, but he had pain. It will besiege you in all your cities until the collapse of your high and fortified walls in which you trusted throughout your land. Let's go back to El San Nosir. Destroy the structure of their civilized pillars, their high world buildings, which they trusted or proud of. It's all there. Leka Dava Shalaramiza Baraisa. Everything is in the Torah. But you know what? There's more. Because what was the name of the mastermind in 2001 that succeeded Nosir? Who actually pulled it off? His name is Mohammed Atta. That name should sound familiar. Because years before, when Clinton, President Clinton, was exerting enormous, inordinate pressure upon Yitzhak Rabin, former Prime Minister of Israel who was assassinated, to make a peace treaty. He prevailed upon Rabin to do something that Rabin, remember Rabin was a fighter. Rabin was a hero, a war hero. He told him, you have to make a major concession. You know what that concession was? There was a guy, an Arab, a Jordanian, who tried to firebomb a bus full of children Israeli, Jewish children, and took his gun and shot up people on the bus. And of course, he fled, went to one country, was extradited back to Israel, was in jail. His name, Mohammed Atta. Clinton says, you gotta, you gotta release him from jail. Rabin has to capitulate. How do you do such a thing? How do you do such a thing? How did the Americans allow that? You know, this really is almost blackmailed. It's like sabotage. What's Rabin going to say? No, he should have said no. He really should have. It's not the same Mohammed Atta. Mohammed Atta that destroyed the World Trade Center was Egyptian. This guy's Jordanian. But I don't think it's a coincidence that they have the same name. Because there's hashkoch in the world. There's providence. Your mistake will come to haunt you. Our mistakes come to haunt us. Today we remember the, not, the World Trade Center, the beautiful Twin Towers. The Twin Towers was the seat of capitalism, was the epicenter of materialism in America, representing the entire world, entire Western Hemisphere. You know what the message may have been? Of course, we don't in any way, in any way, justify Chasashom, the tragedy, Khalila. But perhaps there was an underlying message. Destruction of capitalism, materialism almost, in America, the Western Hemisphere. And perhaps the message is that Americans took too seriously. We indulge too much. Gashmius, our focus is on the petty, frugal, I'm sorry, petty and frivolous things of life instead of being on the spiritual. What's a spiritual attainment? What's a spiritual achievement? Why do we care about how expensive a wedding is or a bar mitzvah is? It's so silly. How much a wig costs, a diamond ring. What happened to us? We're the oil of God, we're the light into the nations. We're the trendsetters. We're supposed to take Hashem and make Him front and center in the world. And that was destroyed, materialism. I want to quote to you. Listen in closing. I'm not going to tell you who said it until the end. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other people have ever grown. We forgot God. We forgot the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we thought that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, 
We've become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to Hashem, to God that made us. This is not from any Torah passage. This is from our former president, Abraham Lincoln, hundreds of years ago. What a lesson. He was a religious man. Avraham, well, Abe Lincoln, even had a beard. Some people confuse him for a rabbi. He was no rabbi, he was not Jewish. But what profound words. It's Elul. Time to wake up. We have a few weeks left to learn the lessons of 9-11. To galvanize ourselves. To become greater. To become stronger in our Judaism and our Yiddishkeit. To understand that our focus has to be Ruchnia's spiritual growth. And Shvuv Yom Echel Lifnei Misesha to return every day. Because it may be our last. We shall all have happy, healthy, fulfilling lives. Arichas Yom and Mishonim Tarvis, wonderful long lives. But it's sobering to think that it may be your last. And of course to remember that ultimately there's no 911 to call. Ain Lanu Li Shain. There's only one force, one power. Ain Oid Milvadoi. There's no other force in the world, in the universe, but Hashem. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for listening.